Well, this morning we are continuing going through the book of Mark. We are in our second week going through this gospel account. And this gospel account is centered around Jesus' call that he made to people to come and follow him. I just want to give you a quick reminder as well, um, if you haven't collected this already, we do have life group material available in the foyer. There is still some of that available, or our life group material is also available online. And in this life group material, you can also grab a daily devotional through Throughout this series, we're going to be racing through the Gospel of Mark fairly quickly over 11 weeks. Uh, But through this daily devotional, you can go a little bit deeper into the different passages throughout the book of Mark. Last week, we saw that there are three parallel stories going on surrounding Jesus throughout the entire book of Mark. The first story is that Jesus is the creator. The second is that he is Messiah. And the third is that he is the Son of God. And if you are able to understand these three things about the book of Mark, that these three parallel stories are going on all at once, then you can understand the whole gospel account. And Jesus' first act, although he is all three of these things, creator, Messiah, and son of God, his first act is an act of humility, because his first act is choosing to be baptized by his fairly eccentric Jewish preacher cousin. Now, there's different stages of Jesus' ministry that he goes through in this gospel account, and Last week we saw the first public appearance of Jesus and we find out a little bit about who he is. And next week, Stephen's going to continue our series uh, as we begin see uh, the, the, uh, the beginning, uh, the opposition that's coming to, uh, to Jesus and his new movement, um, which is beginning to arise. But this week, what we're going to be looking at is Jesus' ministry, which is starting, and it is also beginning to gain momentum as people begin to follow him. And so we're going to go uh, get straight into our passage this morning, which is in Mark 1, 14 to 20. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Mark 1, 14 to 20. It'll also be up there on the screen. And it says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, preaching the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. When he had gone a little farther, He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now, we're not going to go through the whole rest of the chapter of uh, chapter one this morning, just for the sake of time, but can I encourage you, after our time together this morning, go home and read through the rest of this chapter of, uh, of Mark, because following what we just read, we see Jesus performing different miracles in the region of Galilee, and at almost every single point that a miracle takes place, we see the news of Jesus beginning to spread further and further throughout the region. More and more people are hearing about this way of living that Jesus is, uh, is speaking about. The strange thing about this gospel account is that there is no mention of most of Jesus' life. It skips straight to this point where Jesus is 30 years old. He's beginning his ministry and his first words spoken are these words, the time has come The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The gospel, the euangelion, which we spoke about last week. But before Jesus said any of this, Jesus spent most of his life as a tradesman. Jesus was, in, uh, in the original language, something called a tecton, which is what we uh, translate as a carpenter. But Jesus was probably not actually a woodworker. We know this because there's not actually a huge amount of wood in the region of, uh, of Galilee. It's a fairly dry area with no trees. But what Jesus li- likely worked with was basalt lava rocks. So sorry if you are a carpenter joining us. Uh, he was more of a, of a construction worker 
carpenter than what we know carpenters to be. He would have been strong and tough, and he would have worked along his father Joseph in the family business. And then after three years of doing this in relative obscurity, he begins teaching throughout this region called Galilee, and his news is his, that he begins to spread through Galilee. The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. Everything throughout history has been building up to this moment when Jesus says, the time has come. Throughout all history, there has been this waiting for Jesus to come, and now is the moment that has come for, uh, for Jesus. But what Jesus chooses to do next is surprising. If the time has come, you would expect something great to happen after this, but Jesus doesn't choose to do anything uh, that we would necessarily see as remarkable after preaching that the time has come. He doesn't go to any great city like Rome or Jerusalem to preach this message. Rather, he stays around his home area in the region of, uh, in the region of Galilee. On the screen, you can see a, uh, uh, a photo there of the, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, on that screen, there's a much younger, slightly a skinnier version of myself right near the bottom of the, of the uh, Sea of Galilee. Uh, you can see also on the screen a, uh, a map of the Sea of Galilee. And you can see where Jesus would have grown up around the area of Nazareth. But you can also see the different areas where Jesus would have done most of his ministry. Joseph, uh, Jesus sorry, chose to do most of his ministry throughout the top section of the Sea of Galilee in three different villages, which was Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum. These were not influential places by any means, but they were uh, places that were known for their religious fervor for, uh, for the Torah and, uh, and for Jewish teaching. These areas were known as the places that had some of the greatest Jewish uh, teachers in all of Israel, and it was the dream of every Jewish boy to be asked to follow one of these dream teachers. I've got another photo on, uh, on the screen right now of someone who might be known to some of you. Uh, who recognises this person? This is, for some of you, you will know this as Manus Lubbershane. Um, for myself, it is actually Manus Lubbershane. Uh, he is a batter for the Australian cricket team, and currently he is ranked as the top batsman in the world today. But one thing very few people realise is that he was also one of my youth leaders uh, at a church that I was at when I was uh, on the south side of Brisbane. Can we just go to the next slide, please? So once again, that is a much younger version of Dave with, uh, with Manus. Marnus and I, we would catch up regularly for a chai, specifically at our local coffee shop, and we would talk for a long time about a range of different things. But the primary point of conversation, uh, whenever we would catch up, was always about cricket. He had a strong ambition to make it into the Australian cricket team. He had a drive to achieve this, unlike anyone I've ever met who plays sport in their life. There was something within Marnus uh, where he wanted to, uh, to make it as a batsman in cricketer. And on the first day that he did make it into the Australian cricket side, everyone who knew him celebrated because he has finally made it. His ambitions have been realised and he has achieved the top level of, uh, of uh, his sporting uh, ambitions. Now, in ancient Israel, you didn't have aspirations of sports glory or becoming a great actor or a singer. Rather, the things that young Jewish boys would dream of and have aspirations for was to be called a disciple by one of the great teachers uh, that was uh, in, the, uh, in the area of Galilee. It was something that you would dream of, being able to, be, being able to follow one of the great teachers of the Torah. Now, in one sense, it does, make, uh, it does make sense for Jesus to go to this area 
of Galilee to find his team who will walk with him throughout his ministry journey. Because this area had a lot of aspiring Jewish boys who had achieved well in their studies and had an extensive knowledge of the Torah. But the other thing that this area had was a range of fishermen. So there's the two different areas that were are the focuses in this area. You had a lot of academics and a lot of fishermen. This area around Galilee was famous for its fish and it would uh, export fish all over the known world, even as far as Rome. So you would have thought that Jesus would head straight for the academics of this area and invite these people to come and follow him. But Jesus doesn't do this. Rather than heading to this area and asking those people to be his followers, his first disciples, rather, are fishermen. And his call to these disciples is very simple. Come and follow me. The more literal uh, translation is come and be my disciple. This word, uh, it comes from the word Talmud in the original language, and it has the idea of follower or learner or student or apprentice. And in this section of scripture, we see Jesus call uh, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John to be his disciples, and they respond by immediately choosing to follow him. Now this, although we may skip through this fairly quickly, this is a huge deal. They dropped everything that they had and immediately chose to follow Jesus. It was likely that their family business of fishing had been handed down to them throughout generations and would have been worth a good amount of money. These guys, they're doing very well for themselves financially as business owners, but they just drop everything immediately to be Jesus' disciples simply because he has said these words, come and follow me. Why would you do this? Why would you leave a successful business? Why would you leave your finances? Why would you leave your family and success to follow Jesus? And why would you follow this stranger of all people? Now, we can't just skip past this because this is a pretty strange thing to do. I mean, imagine if you went to work tomorrow and you work either in an office or maybe a construction site or something like that. Whatever you have is your dream job that you've been working towards for your whole life. And then suddenly someone walks through the door and tells you to drop everything, quit your job and follow them. You would be very unlikely to do that. I think we could say all of us in the room would be very unlikely to follow someone who is telling us to drop our whole lives and follow them, particularly if they were a stranger. So if we would be unlikely to do that, why would these four guys choose to follow Jesus? There were three levels of um, of education within Jewish society. Um, and whether you got to the next level depended on how well you, uh, you went in your classes. The first level of... No, we'll just go back a slide. Thanks, Lizelle. Um, thank you so much. The first level was called Be- uh, Beit Sefer. And this is what everyone started out doing and was the standard for all Jewish children to do. So both boys and girls would do this and they would do this until the age of, a, uh, of about 12. And what you would do in Bet Sefer is you would uh, memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Now, if you're holding a hard copy Bible, I just invite you to, uh, to get the, those five books Uh, first books of the Old Testament, hold it in your hand and realise the size of what these children were expected to memorise. And this was standard for every Jewish person to do by the age of 12. And this is where education usually stopped for children during this time. After this, what most boys would do is they would head off into their family trade and most girls would go and get married and they would have our children very young. But if you were one of the top male students in the class, probably the top 1%, you would then be invited into the next level of education, which is called Beit Talmud. 
And in Beit Talmud, things were taken to another level. Because at this stage, you weren't just required to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. You had to memorize the whole Old Testament. This happened between the ages of 12 to 14. So they have spent up until the age of 12 just learning the first five books. And then in a couple more years, they are memorizing everything else. For us, we celebrate if we're able to memorize the books of the Bible. These people had to memorize every single word of the Old Testament. This was a, uh, a huge thing to be, uh, to be achieved. But following this educa- stage of education, what most people would do once again is they would graduate and they would head into the family business. But for the rest, for those who were the top 0.01, the best of the best of the best, you could then enter the final stage, which was discipleship. Now, the way that discipleship worked was you would find a rabbi or a respected teacher, you would follow them around a lot, you would get to know them, you would hear their teachings, and they would grill you with questions. And if it got to the stage where this rabbi thought that you were capable and competent and had what it took to really be somebody, he would then say, come follow me, be my disciple. Becoming someone's disciple meant spending every waking moment with your rabbi. It, became, it meant becoming like your rabbi. It meant seeing them as your hero. Some of you who, are, who know me a little bit better would know that I am naturally an introvert. So the idea of following someone like this uh, makes me feel a little bit anxious inside, spending this amount of time uh, with someone. I find energy through being by myself. About half of you in the room, you understand this and you can empathise with me. And so the idea of living like they did through discipleship is something that seems pretty full on to me. Because if you were discipled by a rabbi, you literally followed them and did what they did. You ate when they ate, you slept when they slept, you listened when they spoke, and you tried to draw every bit of wisdom from them that you possibly could as you were discipled by them. Now, getting to this stage, being invited to come and follow someone, this was very, very rare. And for you to be asked to be a disciple was a privilege that very few people were able to experience. And so when Jesus came to these four young men and he said to them, come and follow me, this was a privilege that none of them would have been expecting. These disciples, they were not the most amazing academic students. They had probably not reached even the stage of Beit Talmud. And rather, they were, rather they were fishermen. They were very average, normal guys who were just doing their family business. So for them to be invited to the level of discipleship was a privilege unlike anything that they were, uh, would have ever expected. Jesus is saying to these guys, when he's calling them to be his disciples, he's telling them that he believes in them, that this news that he has been proclaiming around the area of Galilee, that the news of, uh, of, uh, of that God is here, he is encouraging them to then be car- uh, car- carriers of this news wherever they go. When I had um, just graduated from, from high school, one of the pastors of the church I was at, he asked to catch up with me. And, uh, and uh, as we caught up for, for lunch, um, what he began to share with me was that he saw real leadership potential in me and that I should consider um, moving into pastoral ministry. This was something that really shocked me when he shared this with me. This was something that I hadn't anticipated as an 18-year-old. And although I was shocked, I also walked away feeling very encouraged and affirmed. We would catch up for lunch every couple of weeks, and I would receive some coaching and mentoring and affirmation about my calling. This was one of the most pivotal relationships that I ever had in my life. 
but it was also one of the mo- relationships that I remember the most because this guy who was further down the road than me chose to believe in me, chose to affirm me, he chose to encourage me. Now, when Jesus made this call to his disciples to come and follow him, he was telling them that he believed in them. He was telling them that he saw great potential in them and he knew that they were able to accomplish great things. But this invitation from Jesus, it doesn't just stay with his followers, his four followers and then 12 followers back then. This is the same invitation that he makes for us here today. Come and follow me. Jesus makes this invitation for us here today, which is be my disciple. Now, when you understand this call to come and follow Jesus, this is so much more than Jesus just saying, become a Christian. He is saying, come and walk closely with him, learn from him, draw near to him, experience everything that he offers, drink from his wisdom and from his strength, let him become your rabbi. Now, if Jesus calls you to be his disciple, that also means that he believes in you. It was such a great privilege to be able to be called someone's disciple and to be asked to follow someone because it meant that they were choosing you specifically. It doesn't matter how gifted or not gifted you feel. It doesn't matter how average you think of yourself because uh, Jesus believes in you and is able to accomplish great things in you if you allow him to disciple you. This is Jesus' call to us here today, which is to follow him. Now, what we've just spoken about, I just want to change gears um, really quickly. The language of come and follow me is language that is used by Jesus here in the Gospel of Mark, but it is also language that Paul uses later on in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, because Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Here, Paul's language is the same as the language of Jesus, but because Jesus is no longer here on this earth, Paul is telling people, sometimes it might be hard to understand what it looks like to follow Jesus. And so I want to invite you, rather than trying to understand yourself, what it might look like to follow Jesus, follow me as I follow Jesus. Allow me to disciple you as I follow Jesus. And so Paul puts out a Uh, this call out to less mature Christians and saying that he is further down the road in his relationship with Jesus and he's known Jesus for longer, he knows scripture better, so follow me as I follow Jesus, be my disciple. Now one of the things that we want to do here as a church is to be a church where this kind of discipleship happens, where different people who are further down the road are able to invest into others and walk closely alongside them so that they are able to learn more about Jesus. And so if you are someone here this morning who has been wanting to have that person that you can follow as they follow Jesus, we want to give you the opportunity to be able to step into this. And so over the next little while, we're going to be talking a lot about mentoring, because mentoring is one of the ways that this sort of discipling is able to happen. Over the next little, uh, over the, the past little while, sorry, Um, This has been something that God has been doing a lot in the life of our church. There's been a lot of people who have been asking to, uh, to have someone disciple them. And for some of you, this may be how you have been feeling as well. You may have been wanting to be mentored or you may have had a sense that God is calling you into becoming a mentor and we want, to give you the, uh, we want to give you the opportunity to step into this if you are feeling called into this. And so if you have a sense that that is for yourself personally, we have a simple form online that you can fill out either to be mentored 
or to be a mentor. And we will also have some training available on the 28th of May and the 4th of, uh, of June for anyone who would like to become a mentor or to find out more. I currently mentor a couple of young guys in the life of our church, and I'm mentored by a few different people in different areas of my life. And I can honestly say that I grow closer to Jesus in all of these relationships as we learn together and grow in relationship with one another. So that's the quick side, now, side note. We're going to stand and, uh, and sing in just a moment. But before we do that, I just want to uh, draw your eyes back on what we were looking at throughout today. One of the things that you see as Jesus called his disciples to follow him was that their response after that call was to drop everything and to follow him. They did this straight away. They dropped businesses, family, money, all to follow Jesus. And if Jesus makes this call the same for us here today, to follow him, following him also involves for us leaving things behind that aren't from him. Now, for some of you here today, you may have responded to Jesus' call to follow him, but there may have been things that you have held on to that Jesus doesn't want as part of your life. Jesus' call to follow him means leaving things behind. It might be sin, it might be materialism, it might be toxic relationships, it might be anger or jealousy or unforgiveness or addiction. And throughout these next couple of songs, as we sing about surrender, I just invite you to take this opportunity to surrender yourself afresh and respond to Jesus' call to follow him. Leave those things beside, giving those up and commit to, uh, to following Jesus afresh once again. So when you stand as the team comes up, and let's, uh, let's pray together. God, we thank you for uh, this call that you make to us to come and follow you. Thank you for choosing us to follow you. And God, I just really want to pray for anyone here this morning who might not feel like they are good enough or they might feel too average to follow you. God, would you just remind them that you see them as special and unique and that if you are calling them to follow you, that you are able to accomplish great things. God, as we respond this call, to this call to follow you, would you help this to be something that we do every single day? We want to be discipled by you. We want to draw close to you and drink from your goodness and your love and your mercy for us. We want to sit under your teaching and learn more about who you are every single day. But particularly, God, for anyone here this morning who may have responded to that call to follow you at one stage, and maybe they've allowed some of the things that they've left behind to creep back into their life, I just really pray that you will remove those things in this moment as we begin to surrender to you. I just want to pray for anyone who might be holding on to sin or materialism, to anger or jealousy or unforgiveness, or addiction? Or do you want to leave all of these things behind and respond to your call? We know that what you have for us in our life is so much better, so much more joy-giving and life-giving. So help us, God, to be followers of you every single day. In Jesus' name, amen.